Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. Um, how well do you know yourself? Or maybe I should change the stress there. How well do you know yourself? <clears throat> what are its qualities, its strengths, its weaknesses? Was it fully formed at birth or shaped by the society and the culture you grew up in? Is it fundamentally good or fundamentally bad? And if it's bad, can you change it? Might it be completely different from how you imagine it to be? Has it been the same since the beginning of human history or has it evolved? Is it something common to all of us or rather infinitely varied? Is it really an it at all? Might it really be a they? Or is it possible that the self, as we think of it, doesn't really exist at all? Now that I've hopefully called everything you hold dear into question, it's time to bring in journalist and novelist Will Storr, whose latest work, Selfie, How We Became So Self-Obsessed and What It's Doing to Us, seeks answers to all of those questions, and others too. Taking the reader on a journey from ancient Greece to 21st century Silicon Valley via a Scottish monastery, a Californian countercultural retreat centre and the twisted digital arteries of cyberspace, Selfie is massively ambitious in its scope while remaining accessible and thoroughly entertaining throughout. It might even change the way you see the world. Surely the greatest compliment any book can be given. Will Storr's features have appeared in many publications, including The Guardian Weekend, The Times Magazine, Observer Magazine, GQ, Marie Claire and The Sydney Morning Herald. He's a contributing editor at Esquire Magazine and has been named New Journalist of the Year and Feature Writer of the Year and has won a National Press Club Award for Excellence. In 2010, his investigation into the kangaroo meat industry won the Australian Food Media Award for Best Investigative Journalism and in 2012 he was presented with the One World Press Award and the Amnesty International Award for his work on sexual violence against men. In addition to Selfie, he's the author of The Heretics, Adventures with the Enemies of Science, Will Storr vs. the Supernatural, and the novel The Hunger and the Howling of Killian Lone. Please join me in welcoming him to Shakespeare and Company. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, <laughs> I guess where I'd like to start is what brought you to this subject matter in the first place? What what was it that um, led you to want to spend several years of your life investigating the concept of the self? Uh, okay, so I, I suppose the answer is it, it was my previous book. So it's my previous book, The Heretics, is, a, is like an investigation into belief, why we believe what we believe, and specifically why intelligent people believe crazy stuff. So like my dad, for example, went to Oxford, but believes in the literal truth of the Bible. He thinks the devil's this kind of guy that exists. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. So I wrote a book about, you know, kind of investigating how this happens. And, and the kind of, just sort of, sort of in brief, kind of the thesis ended up being that we all live our lives as if it's a story, a heroic kind of story. And we're like this heroic, morally heroic character in the story. And we tend to uncritically believe any fact that flatters that story. And that was fine. And that, but that led me with a slightly unsatisfying ending, because it's like... It, it, it led me to a place where I was thinking, well, people don't really change their beliefs then, do they? Like, once you've got your precious beliefs, my lovely beliefs, see, they don't change. And then people started asking me at events just like this, so what, what, how do people change? And I'd go, uh, well, and I wouldn't know the answer. So <laughs> I, started, I started in my journalism seeking out people who'd had undergone like massive changes to try and find out the answer so there were lots of them one of them appears in the book john pridmore who's this guy who was like a really ultra violent east london gangster who became catholic he ended up being in selfie but there were lots of others too there was like a 9-11 truther that became a 9-11 factor i don't know what you call those people <laughs> uh, somebody that was like a big gm uh, like a big eco-terrorist but now is a pro gm campaigner and then i came across this guy roy baumeister who was this um uh, uh very eminent american psychologist and he was one of these guys in the 80s and 90s that was researching this idea of self-esteem and so the idea of the, of the self-esteem movement of the 80s and 90s which i grew up in the middle of was that um self-esteem was like this social vaccine and all we needed to do to become perfect people was to believe we were wonderful and special and amazing and then he changed his mind and proved that idea was wrong and then i thought that's amazing because that was this one idea that i grew up with and, and it's wrong and it changed the generation because what the what the data finds is that the children of the self-esteem generation became more narcissistic um so that was the that was the beginning of the book because i thought that's really interesting there's this one idea that didn't just change one person it changed everyone mm. pretty much so that that's a very long answer, but that's that was the beginning of the book. <laughs> so there was this, there was this feeling then that you when when you're heading into the book and we kind of we, we we're yeah. with you on your journey. Yeah. Um, that in fact your concept of the self was quite fluid, as you say. This kind yeah. of this idea of the self as defined by the self esteem movement, movement had been undermined. Yeah. Um, and I found that fascinating because it's rare, I think, to go into a non-fiction book where the the writer doesn't have any sort of 
real clear stated opinion or preconceptions. Oh yeah. I mean, did did you have an uh, a clear idea of the self? before you started writing it uh well not before i started researching it but that's that's something i always try and do in my non-fiction books because my uh, uh, too often for me non-fiction books feel like being at school and i hated being at school <laughs> like it's just a textbook and then you open the book and they tell you what the, the idea is and then like they just spend ages repeating the idea at you and so what, what i like to do with my non-fiction is to tell a story which you know and and, and part of that is taking the reader with me and or, you know giving them the facts gradually as i learn the facts and hopefully that's hopefully that's a much more entertaining and immersive way of uh, 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 of reading a non-fiction book that's what i that's that's what i like to think anyway and, 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 and obviously the 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 term selfie i mean it's mm. a it's a very new formulation yeah. i mean I, i'm not sure exactly when it entered the yeah. the lexicon but it's very new and it, it, it does feel like a very relevant subject matter for for now actually this kind of this uh obsession with the self this obsession with um how we how that self appears yeah to other people um and as i said in the introduction however you you do take us and we'll talk about this in a moment like back to, to ancient greece and mm. through the christian middle age middle ages did you have a sense when you started your research that the the scope would be so broad no i mean that, that that's one of the kind of brilliant things about being able to sort of being lucky enough to actually go on one of these kind of journeys with writing these books is that you have this kind of vague idea that you take to the publisher and they go yeah well, go go and do it mm -hmm. and then you start researching and then you suddenly have these moments of almost like terrifying moments thinking oh god now i've got to learn about ancient greece and like, oh <laughs> god now i've got to learn what neoliberalism is and then you've got to suddenly you've got this massive job ahead of you you know um but um <clears throat> but it's exciting too, and 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 that was that, I mean, that that was that was I think that was probably the point where the, when I really realised this is a much bigger story than I'd anticipated. Like I took the idea to the publisher was is the self esteem movement and it's how that led to our narcissistic today. But then I read about this amazing work by the group of psychologists um, and the, the guy the pioneers guy called Richard Nisbet, and he they study what they call the geography of thought, and that's this. That's this idea that who we are as a people emerges from our environment. And so what they do is they look at, um, they, they begin looking at kind of the West and Western people today. And uh, uh, and the idea is that, that the way we kind of experience the world goes back to ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, how can that be? And it, uh, and so what they say is, well, that's, that's where this idea of Western individualism began. And it began because of the ecology of ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. So... The, the, the landscape of ancient Greece, I'm sure lots of you have been to Greece, you can't do much like big farming in ancient Greece. It's all like uh, mountains descending to sea, small islands, it's, you know, this rough scrub, there's no good soil. So what that meant for the people in ancient Greece is they had to be a hustler to get by, to get along and get ahead. You had to hustle, you had to be a small business person. So you had to be a kind of Thatcherite, really. You had to make, do olive oil, make pottery, trade, you know, barter. Um, there was lots of fishing going on and there was lots of trading, you know, and it was a land... And it wasn't like a, a nation as we have a nation now. It was a thousand, roughly a thousand individual city-states. So people were trading with each other. And so this individualistic, atomized physical landscape led to an individualistic atomized worldview and and it, and it encouraged things like debate you know people would debate ideas with each other and it, it encouraged you know individual competition so of course the olympics is the obvious one and then you get the, you get the you get body worship mm -hmm. i mean it's amazing to see some of the statues of the I ideal body that were around in ancient greece and you could literally you could put them in love island mm -hmm. or you could put them on the front of men's health and they would look exactly they would look exactly right so that was amazing to me when you god that's amazing and then what, what they do is they compare that with people who come from a Confucian culture, which is like the opposite. So in, in ancient China, 2,000 years ago, lots of big farming projects. And to get along and get ahead, you had to be part of a group. Mm -hmm. So you had to privilege the group over the individual. And what they do is they study people now. And, and, and so I, I talk about quite a few of these tests in selfie. But, but what, I think what, one of those that sticks in my head is that um, they, um, th th they, they make... Uh, American teenagers and uh, teenagers from China watch a, a, a video of, of, of a fish tank for three seconds, and then they and then they and then they it, they they look at where the eyes are moving. And if you're a Westerner, what you tend to do is look at the big flashy orange like fish at the front, who's you know. <laughs> uh, 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 but but for the but, but for the Chinese student, their eyes are darting all about the context because they're used to seeing the world in context. And you ask them afterwards, what did you see? And the Westerner will go, oh, I saw a fish. Mm -hmm. But the person person from China will go, well, I saw a 
fish tank and there was always fish and there were these rocks. So, so, so as Nisbet says, it literally affects how we experience the world. It's not just, we think of culture as this thing, oh, it's what kind of books you read, what kind of newspapers you read, but it, it affects even how your eyes are e- examining and building your picture of the world. It's quite extraordinary. And I think that's one of the first kind of rug-pulling moments of the book in a <laughs> yeah. way. It's sort of like... Um, and I think I'm a victim of this as much as everybody else. Like, we have this concept of certain things which almost sort of... We, we accept almost without question. So this kind of... This this ancient Greek view of the world, this kind of, I guess, uh, individualism, this view of the certain mm. conception of beauty. Um, and I think we have a tendency to say, oh, that's the kind of the natural yeah, way of things. That's just the obvious way of being alive, yeah. Right, yeah. and then, you know, it just takes one or two examples. And, of course, you're very careful to... To specify that you know you can generalize about groups, but yes. obviously everyone's yeah. individual experience. Of course, there's huge overlap. It, yeah, yeah. yeah, but yeah. it's sort of those moments. Okay, so if let's say this is the ancient Greek way of looking at things, and that sort of has a big influence on me, and yet in, for example, in China they're influenced by the Confucian mm. way of looking at things. When you started to get a, a feeling for that landscape, was the kind of the obvious reaction then? Well, well, maybe the self as a kind of as a common human thing doesn't really exist at all i, I think it does work well, because so, so so the book begins with with, with actually the, the the stuff that is common to us all you know and, and so one of the things about the human animal is, and we're an animal we're an ape is that we spent you know we spent more than 90 percent of our time on the earth as big hunter gatherers you know we've not been in living in towns and cities we've been living in hun- in, in groups that have been traveling around um uh, I- I- together trying to survive and, and and so that that that's when our brains have done and ourselves have done most of their evolving and that's still really powerful and that's universal stuff and and, and of course there's lots of things that are important still today you know and one of the ones i talk a lot about is the fact that we're all so tribal Mm -hmm. and you know one of the animals that we have most in common with is the chimpanzee Mm -hmm. of course and 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 the humans and chimpanzees are groupish Mm -hmm. and what we do uh you know uniquely in animal kingdom is we go to war with other groups so you know we we feel this identification with our groups and and for humans today they're psychological Mm -hmm. groups so they're trump and clinton or Mm -hmm. Apple and Android or whatever they are, we can't help but identify with groups and, and you know, b- b- think in a biased and prejudiced way about ourselves and other groups. That's mm-hmm. just what we do. Uh, but we, you know, importantly, we, we go to war with other groups mm-hmm. and, we, and when people break the codes of our group, we don't just take that as a passive, mm-hmm. oh, they've broken the codes of our group. We want to kill them, and you know, and, th- and that it yes. arises very much in social media today you know yeah. when you look at twitter you've only got to look at twitter the behind on twitter and facebook it's just to, to see that and actually what's interesting is some of the language you see on social media mm-hmm. the status update how many followers do i have mm-hmm. it's also <laughs> tribal and so it's really interesting to me to see that that, that you know that this ultra modern technology mm-hmm. is actually its electricity is ancient ancient powerful yeah. dangerous like juju really. and you explore that through um this person you've already mentioned the uh, john pridmore yeah um who i think is somebody just because he's one of i mean there are m- many vibrant characters in this <laughs> book uh, but i think he is certainly one of the one of the most colorful <laughs> characters yeah, let's yeah. say uh, would you just be able to uh, give us a quick kind of a potted bio of john pridmore yeah, and how john, your yeah uh, so time he's, with him yeah so he's the guy that i actually interviewed him for esquire he's the guy that that made the book who was who went for this change and he's an extraordinary guy so he grew up um uh, in the east end of london and his dad was a kind of a policeman but i think a probably quite a corrupt policeman uh, and uh he yeah he he um he, his parents brought up when he was very young and he sort of went into petty crime and then, in, then went into not petty crime and he became an enforcer for the gang that was responsible for the drug trade of the west end of london and so he he'd walk around he had a special bespoke leather coat on and he had a special pocket in there for his knife and a special pocket in there he had a jiff squeezy lemon bottle with acid in it it's become quite fashionable that now uh, where he'd squeeze people's eyes and and um and he uh, and he just yeah so he, he you know he he kept telling me that he nearly killed this guy and nearly killed that guy. And I thought, nearly? <laughs> really? But there was one time that he told me... What, so there was one particular... He, um, he, um, he, 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 he punched somebody outside a nightclub. Because what he'd say... So what the, how it would work was he would do the security outside nightclubs. And, so how, so, and, and he would do that because they'd only let his drug dealers in. And if somebody was caught dealing drugs that weren't part of his firm, they would be in serious trouble. <laughs> Uh, so that's that's why he was a security guy and he punched somebody and the guy fell over and his kind of head exploded a bit and his boss went 
you know, uh, John, you need to have a weekend off, mate. You're going to kill somebody. And if you're in prison, you're no use to me. So he goes home and he goes back to his flat. And he's a really rich man. He's driving a, like a Rolls Royce, I think it was. And he's going to kind of champagne and Coke parties. And he's got, you know, he's, got, he's like living the dream um, in, in a slightly evil way. And uh, not even slightly evil way, in a really evil way. And then, and then he, he goes, oh, I need, to have, I need to have a little holiday because I keep nearly killing people. And, um, and he turns on the telly and he lights a spliff. And the television starts talking to him and starts listing all of the things he's ever done wrong in his life. And this is where it gets really interesting for me, because uh, how do you react when, when you hear a voice in a room? So John's mum was Catholic, very strongly Catholic, and he was brought up in a Catholic household. And he never really rejected religion, but he never particularly accepted it. He had this kind of ambivalent relationship to Catholicism. And so what John's brain does is he goes, is it goes well, I know what that voice is. That voice is the devil, and that means it's telling me I'm going to go to hell. And that, what that means is... I need to say sorry and repent, and then I'll be okay. So that's exactly what he does. He goes out into the into the street, to, he falls onto his knees and goes, oh, I need to be nicer. And he feels this kind of this immense rush of ecstasy. And he goes round to his mum's house, because he's like, I want to see my mum. And he knocks on his mum's door, and his mum opens the door, and she goes, what, you, what do you want, John? And he goes, mum, something's happened. What, something's happened? And she goes, what happened, John? And he goes, um, I found God. And she goes, at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I love that bit. Uh, and, and, but it was interesting because, I mean, and that leads into a really sort of important thing about how the human brain, is, the human self is structured. Because you hear lots of people saying quite glibly, oh, the self is a story. And it, but it really is a story. And there are these really interesting experiments that were done in the 60s which kind of bore this out. And ra- I want to go into the technical detail because you'll get bored. But like, um, <laughs> how it essentially works is we've got a little voice in our head. It's like the internal monologue. They call it the interpreter. And what that interpreter does is it, it takes in all the inputs, all the things we're feeling, uh, all the things we're seeing and hearing, and it puts them all together into this kind of coherent narrative that kind of makes us feel good about ourselves and makes us feel as if we have control. They call it a confabulation. So, so when you, people ask you, how do you feel? Oh, I feel great. Why do you feel great? Oh, because of X, Y, and Z. That's your interpreter just making stuff up. It doesn't actually have any access to your unconscious directly. It doesn't know, you don't really know why you're feeling what you're feeling and why you're thinking what you're thinking. You don't really know why you're doing what you're doing. It's the weird thing. It's all a confabulation. You just act and you've got this voice that's just explaining it all away. It's really quite a disturbing thing that they, the guy won a Nobel Nobel Prize actually for I didn't realize that was right in the book he ran the Nobel Prize finding out and that's what John's brain did it, it kind of saw this speaking voice and rather than doing what I do is going I'm having a psychotic breakdown I need to call an ambulance he went oh it's just the devil and actually he survived you know the, the, this confabulation it saved him and now he goes around he's like a superstar Catholic so the, the, so the story <laughs> this confabulation yeah. has no connection to what's really going on. This is what the experiments discovered? Yeah, it's, it, it's not the, no, no direct connection. So, so that's not to say it doesn't get it right a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. So sometimes, why are you eating a sandwich? Oh, because I'm hungry. I mean, you know, sometimes it's going to get it right. But, it, but that's just chance. It just has no, it has no direct access. Most of us is, most of us is unconscious. Mm-hmm. And, the, and so this, this left, they call it the left brain interpreter. It's just chirruping away all the time. And it's there to make you feel in control. It's there to give you this, this, this feeling that you've got you know, this free will as we believe, as it seems that we have, even though we probably haven't. And, 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 it's, yeah, and, and it's, it's a really key sort of crucial understanding of, 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 the, of the self is this idea. It's a profoundly unsettling. It's really uh, unsettling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, and part of what it does is it's is, is, is there to make us feel in control, um, you know, because there's huge debate in psychology about whether we have free will or not. Mm. But the disturbing thing about that debate isn't do we have free will or don't we have free will. It's like, do we not have any free will at all, or do we have a tiny kind of marginal <laughs> bit of free will? That's the main argument, you know. So it's really most most people think we don't have free will in the sense that we feel that we do, but it makes us feel as if we do have free will because it tells you, oh, you, you know, uh, it makes it, it it tells you, oh, yes, you you chose to do this, you cho- you chose to believe this, you chose to believe in God, you chose. And to, generally, as you write you know, it, because it's quite a forgiving narrative as well, sort of like you said, people in experiments tend to kind of overestimate their their oh, own moral massively qualities, yeah example. yeah i mean i talk about that a lot more in the heretics actually i mean i talk also about these ideas in the heretics I talk about it actually a bit, a bit more because it's more relevant to the heretics but yeah we tend to really we we like to think with with a morally heroic 
I mean, one is a guy called Chris Frith, a neuroscientist. He says the brain makes us feel as if we are um, the invisible actor at the centre of the world. But, 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 but I add to that, it's a moral actor too. So Donald Trump believes he's a moral actor. He believes he's a good man. And, and all the beliefs that he accepts have to flatter that central thing. So, 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 so that's why he, he's happy to re watch Fox News. And it feels to him like the truth because it makes him feel like he's the good moral man that his brain wants to make him feel that he is. And that, you know, that is... And that is the source of so many of our dodgy illusory delusory beliefs and that of course i mean it's an interesting comparison between the sort of the, the talking about the goodness of the self because mm. you have sort of successive sections in the book one the first one is called the bad self yes and the next one is called the good self yes of course, the bad self is the result of essentially the kind of the judeo-christian uh, approach of kind of original sin and something yeah. that was kind of drummed into us is specifically in Europe through that's it several yeah. millennia. So there's a big there's a big break, mm. uh, and so you know the story is telling the story of the Western self from ancient Greece, and and there are two big kind of phases really. The main phase has been the bad self. So mm. what what what's been the religious stories? Uh, you know th throughout all that time, it's been that, that we have original sin that mm. we that human the, the human self is essentially bad. Mm -hmm. You can try and be perfect, but you're not going to make it because you've got original sin. And then of course Freud comes along, but he's not that much different. Mm -hmm. I have argued to, to the consternation of some critics <laughs> because because what he said was, well, you've got Oedipus complex. Mm -hmm. You know, you were right, old pervert. Mm -hmm. You know, so 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 he had the same idea but the big change happens in the 50s 60s in america mm. in california believe it or not with um with these guys led by carl rogers uh -huh. who had this revolutionary idea that actually people are good and deep down people are good and this is just a revolution in the western self because suddenly there comes this idea that deep down we're, we're good and the badness of, of us is the stuff that society puts yeah. on us and so in order to become good we have to get rid of all that crap and 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 reach down into our perfect inner goodness and of course from that comes self-esteem mm. comes all of these ideas that we're still living in amongst today before we explore that idea particularly mm. when you just said uh, it comes from california you mm. know where else <laughs> yeah there, there is this sense of kind of uh, particularly in the 20th century a lot of the kind of the the ideas um associated with with the self and the yeah. promotion of the, the, the sort of the good self are very kind of geographically very it's precisely weird. located yeah so when i was interviewing Coast. nisbet the, the geography of thought guy about ancient greece i said you know what so how does it work like what's the kind of layout of all this ind individualistic thought and he said basically the further west you go the more individualistic mm -hmm. the more delusion about um control about mm -hmm. how much control we have over ourselves until you all fall until you get to california essentially and it all falls into the ocean and it was weird being at esalen this kind of mm -hmm. you know the big kind of hub of all these ideas you're actually on the cliff as it falls yeah. into the ocean and you know and, and uh, it's not in the book but at the very end of the book i'm, I'm with all these silicon valley hella hack hostels people we're driving to a rocket launch an elon musk <laughs> rocket launch and we drove past esalen and it's just like it's so weird mm -hmm. how it's just it is this pocket of mm -hmm. land that is about as far west as you can go before mm -hmm. it all falls into the ocean as nisbet says but uh, there, i don't have an explanation as to why that is uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> i don't think anybody does it's odd well, let, well let's let's stay with esalen for a while because i had i had um i mean I, I i was familiar with the ideas of um with carl rogers and yeah. some of his acolytes who mm. you you talk about too but this particular center this retreat mm. center I'd, I'd never come across it before and it's right. fascinating and it's mind-boggling yeah and it's kind of it's the stuff that sort of I don't know, a Thomas Pynchon novel is made of. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a deeply strange place. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about your experience yeah, there? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm sure some of you have heard of the Esalen Institute. If you've never seen Mad Men, it's where Don Draper ends up <laughs> at the end of Mad Men. That's Esalen. So, so, so I mean, Esalen was really the intellectual... Um, uh, kind of battery for the kind of hippie, communistic hippie generation. It's where all the kind of big thinkers pass through. It's where they all taught, did workshops, you know, um, um, starting with kind of Carl Rogers. And, 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 and um, so what, they, what happened there was they used to have these great encounter groups, mm -hmm. they called them. That was this Carl Rogers idea, where, where what you do, because inside of us all is perfect and all the badness of us is society's laid it on us as we've grown up so what, they just lock you in a room essentially for sometimes for months with complete strangers and and what they would say was okay from now on we have to be completely authentic with each other you've got to tell me exactly what you think about me and i have to tell you what exactly what i think about you and then eventually we'll strip away you like an onion and we'll get this perfect center inside but what actually happened was people started like killing themselves and having nervous breakdowns <laughs> but that's what happened and, and and um and it was just an extraordinary kind of period um an extraordinary idea really see i can't think of anything worse <laughs> than the the experience that you've just described yeah um 
and yet you decided to subject yourself to this. I mean, it's, sort yes. of, it's I guess, full sort of journalistic kind of ethics. You decided, okay, if I'm going to write about it, yeah. I have to, you've got to I have get to stuck in, haven't you? Like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. Well, tell us a little about it. Like, yeah. How- so the, obviously, they, they don't do when, when everyone started killing themselves in the end of the '60s and beginning of the '70s. They stopped doing the big encounter groups because they were starting to get a bad reputation. But Eslam was really. I mean, it was in, incredibly influential. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they had like 10,000 people passing through Esalen in, you know, in the 60s and then they, all these kind of little, little Esalen started build, coming up over all around America uh, and they started, you know, um, uh, the ideas were very influential in Stanford so the early Silicon Valley guys were going to Esalen and Esalen people were taking their ideas into Stanford, all the psychologists in Stanford. So there's lots of cross-pollination there. Um, uh, uh, but obviously they, they did stop doing the big, really intense sessions but they still do sessions like that there and the memory is called the max mm-hmm. and 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 it's uh, it's the one i did and 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 it's the one that's got the most in common with those the, the encounter groups that were going on in the 60s and it was pretty horrific i mean it was that it was that classic thing where i kind of went on thinking i'm just an observer i'm just a writer i'm not here to take part i'm not going to get sucked into the madness <laughs> and then and then um I did actually, yeah. So they, they, you have to go on. Like the first thing you have to do is you have to go on stage, and um, it's like, is all the people are there and all the lights are in your eyes, and th- they've got this thing where they go, um, you have to stand there and you have to describe the feelings that you're feeling in your body. And this is a woman called Paula who runs, and she's in her seventies. She's been doing it for decades, and um, and somehow it always it always ends up with I'm feeling bad. And then, and then she says, who's the first person that ever made you feel like that? And literally everybody that was up there, the answer was, my father. And then you go, all right, uh, they go, put your father out there, put your father out there. And you had to lock eyes with somebody, sorry, you're going to be my father, <laughs> in the audience. And, um, and, and like, that's your father. If, your, fa- if, that, if the, your father was here, what would you say to him right now? And of course, you're just in floods. You just start crying. And I thought, I'm not going to do that. And I was doing that. I was crying. <laughs> it was a bad. And, and actually, if it, I have to admit, it felt like a trick. It felt like a trick, like a, like, a, like a trick had been paid on me. But it ended up being actually, um, it, I, do you know what? I think it, 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 it did kind of changed me like I went there as a classic introverted Englishman just thinking kill me now <laughs> you know w- w- amongst all these really extreme Americans and by the end of it you know I just felt accepted by the group I, so uh, w- one of the things she did is, is this Fritz Perls idea it was Fritz Perls was one of the big encounter group guys that was going in the 70s and he was a real bastard and you know so you get these ideas that are still with us to now about authenticity be yourself be real that all comes from Esla and that all comes from these Fritz Perls encounter groups and and if he thought you were being fake in his groups you, he would just pillory you you'd be destroyed and um and, and that's very much present in the max too and and one of the things that he had to do was he, he worked out who, who is the self that you really are scared you are right who is that person and then he'd make you be that person completely be that person and they do that at the max so you know one of the things that i'm scared i'm because i'm a grumpy bugger <laughs> is that i'm really scared i'm a grumpy old fucking a grumpy old man you know like horrible old guy and she was like okay so you've got to be that grumpy old man and it's actually amazing <laughs> so, that, so that there was a, there was a woman there who was scared that she was dirty and disgusting so she had to be a cave woman and she had to she, she dressed herself up in all these rags and um and, and then she and she left the group one time and she was literally up on a tree branch urinating out of this tree branch and i was like you're fucking disgusting because <laughs> it was my job to be as hor- be horrible so i got to be really horrible to her and it was brilliant <laughs> uh, uh, um, but 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 then when um, when the task was over, I actually felt I felt quite relieved, and it was actually quite powerful because like that's the person I'm scared I am, that horrible, judgmental, grouchy git. And then I realised that it's nothing; it's just a mood that sometimes I'm in, and it actually isn't, doesn't have this power over me that, that I thought it did. Mm-hmm. So despite my cynicism, my Esalen th- experience was actually quite positive for me. Mm-hmm. In the well, end, this, this is it. Like I think there's um, when I was reading it, like reading about some of the ideas of. Carl Rogers and some of the yeah. practices. I mean, as I said, the encounter group sounded horrific, but mm. I can kind of see there might be a value, there might yeah. be a kind of a positive outcome to it. But one of the things that struck me most was just the extent of the influence of these ideas yeah. on society at large. Yeah. Um, and sort of so what came out of Esalen, as you said, like people left and they went to Stanford, they went to yeah. different places. Yeah. But I mean, I, I guess the sort of the, the two big ones that you sort yeah. of focus on are. Uh, neoliberalism yeah. through the channel of Anne Rand, yeah. 
and also the the self esteem movement. Yeah. So so I, I guess the other the thing I don't really talk about in the book that much, but it is so you know it's so common for us today to do things like meditation, yoga, all these kind of spiritual but non religious things to ourselves that are for self-improvement and that all comes from Esalen that started at Esalen so the guys who started Esalen were in Pondicherry and discovered all these you know yoga meditation and came back to Esalen and they started doing these programs there and that's where it begins so this idea of either you know it started as a very upper middle class American thing and kind of still is probably a little bit um uh, uh, uh so, so all that kind of um spirit non-religious spiritualism myself is god and and it's and it's the self inside me that i need to nurture that all comes from esalen so it's just hugely hugely influential um but the, yes but the self-esteem movement traces its roots there too through this guy called john vasconcellos who's the core to the self the, the, the story that's in uh, selfie so john vasconcellos really does the story in microcosm he's brought up this guy is american guy he's brought up in a very strict catholic household with the, uh, with, and he was taught that you know you, should, you must never speak well of yourself you're you're horrible you're you know it's the catholic thing i was brought up as catholic it's horrible thing. catholics in your story yeah no, well, it's, it's, it's cause I'm, i know because i'm just still trying to exercise my demons but yeah no i totally get it and th but then he um and then he, he 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 becomes really successful he becomes a lawyer at a very young age and then becomes a politician then has this spectacular <laughs> breakdown um when he's when, when he's a when he's a politician in the california assembly and he discovers this um he goes to help for help psychological culture guy father leo rock who's a, obviously a catholic priest but he's a weird catholic priest because he's friends with carl rogers and he's really interested in all these human potential ideas and he discovers the human potential movement he discovers that all these ideas he grew up with was with the opposite of the truth actually inside he's amazing and brilliant and wonderful and special and he feels that it's transformed his life so he goes from being this very buttoned up guy with a black tie on short haircut to going into the assembly with his chest hair out and medallions he's driving his um <laughs> Verb around um, Sacramento with a top down, even when it's raining. Um, so, but he's, he's, he's this, like he, I think one of the newspaper reports at the time said he looks looks like a cross between a drug dealer and uh, something else. But yeah, like he really did. He let it all hang out. But he, he he felt that he transformed. But actually, he was still a very angry man. He was he was really people were terrified of him. But he became a very powerful man. He became the chairman of the Ways and Means Commission, which means he was in charge of all the money essentially in California. So he was the second most powerful guy in the state uh, and then and then he go, discovers esalen he goes to eight like encounter workshops at esalen which is a lot you know um he becomes obsessed with these ideas and he has this idea i know so i, I want to do for the people of california what human potential has done for me and i want to mm. sort of give them self-esteem so if i can take these human potential ideas and put them into law you know change the way we, we we treat our prisoners change the way we educate our students change the way we raise our children ah, that, that could be amazing so that's what he does and so in 1986 he tries to get this idea of the self-esteem task force off the ground where he um he, he says to the legislature I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend three years investigating this idea of self-esteem because it's the 80s now so what the, and so so we're in this neoliberal economy now is we've gone beyond the hippies it's a bit more of a harder idea it's this idea that in order to become more competitive uh, in this economy we we, we need to have high self-esteem and he called it a social vaccine so the idea was if we give everyone a high self-esteem it's this vaccine that will cure us of everything it will be it'll make us richer mm -hmm. it will cure things like domestic violence drug dealing alcoholism homelessness like gang warfare was the big story of the time so it was it would get rid of all the gangs teenage pregnancy was a big moral outrage thing at the time it would get rid of all that and he convinced he convinced the legislature that, this, that there was something in this and he promised them he said i've seen the science on this and i know that there is a cause positive effect and so what he means by that is that high self-esteem causes all these great outcomes and i'm going to prove it and i'm going to prove it by recruiting the best scientists we have to spend three years investigating this idea and they're going to prove that self-esteem is a social vaccine so that's what he does and then but, but, but when the when the task force is announced he's a joke like literally johnny carson on the tonight show is like taking the piss out of him um, there's, a, there's a very famous and influential cartoonist in the states um gary trudeau who does a, who, who has these cartoons that are syndicated all over the country and he and he has a two-week run of cartoons exclusively <laughs> devoted to vasco and his crazy task force all the editorials in the new york times the washington post what is going on in california it's a laughing stock self-esteem whatever next so it's a it's a disaster to start off with and then three years later he announced to the world ah the science is in i was right 
self-esteem as a social vaccine. And then everyone's like, bloody hell. You know, we weren't expecting this. And literally, I mean, I, was, I, I spent uh, a year investigating this. I went through all the archives in Sacramento, all the archives in um, Santa Barbara, looking through all the old press cuttings. And it's extraordinary. You know, Time magazine, the Jeers are turning to cheers, New York Times, uh, you know, Washington Post, they're all now saying... We got this guy wrong. Actually, this is amazing. You know, this is incredible, this finding. He, he, his people start contacting the Oprah Winfrey. He goes on the Oprah Winfrey show. She decides that self-esteem is the big catchword for the 90s. And it changes the world. This idea goes around the world. He's invited to the Soviet Union. This is during the Cold War to speak to the Soviet people about... Um, self-esteem and how they should love themselves more like it's extraordinary uh, and it becomes viral this idea and it literally changes everything it changes the way changes the way we, we taught our children it still does i interviewed an educational psychologist who's active now and says these ideas still now are prevalent in schools it changed the way you know we 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 we, we, we taught our children and it was wrong. <laughs> and so I spent, I spent two years, uh, uh, as I said, uh, no, I spent, I spent a year investigating this, and, and I tracked down former members of the task force. And when you open the task force's final report where they announce self-esteem as a social vaccine, all the, it's 25 members, they've all signed it, signed it, signed it. But there's a space, there's a gap, and there's a guy called David Shanahoff Kalsa who didn't sign the thing. So I tracked him down, and he was quite, he, he was kind of a, the, 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 the topic of, the subject of some derision at the time, because he was this white guy who wore a turban. And, um, and 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 uh, which is a bit cruel. Why couldn't? Why can't he wear a turban? But there we go. And then he uh, went around his house and said to Barbara, and he answers the door. His turban's still there. I was like, great. And and, and yeah, and he, it was amazing. He he said, I he, he he showed me the actual official work of the task force, that, and it said we have not found this causative link. Self-esteem does not find this stuff. And when we are finding these links, it's very un, we're very unsure about why they're there. Um, and he said um, that I said he said I was sitting two seats away from Vasconcelos when he first saw this scientific literature, and I heard him say, "If the legislature, i.e., the government, find out what's in these reports, we're going to have our funding taken away." And he said from that point on, they covered the whole thing up. And then I also tracked down the lead scientist who said the same thing. It was a complete cover up. And then I, because Vasco died a couple of years ago, I, but I tracked down his right hand man, Andrew Mecca, who's a very senior politician. And the task force's chairman, he quite happily admitted, yeah, we covered it up. Because he's convinced still <laughs> the self-esteem was amazing. And he said, oh, yeah, we just got these spin doctors and we, we made sure we had meetings with all the editors and the TV producers. And we got our story in. And it wasn't that amazing, an amazing thing to do. But it wasn't an amazing thing to do because what you find literally from 1990 when all this stuff starts happening in the psychological literature is rates of narcissism start going up mm -hmm. and they go up and up and up and up and up and up right into the 21st, first decade of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't an amazing thing. It was a really mm -hmm. bad thing. <laughs> it does seem to be one of those kind of ideas which, um, in a way, when it's explained sort of self-esteem, it, it seems kind of logical. Yeah. But then I also think of... Um, I think it was the, the comedian George Carlin mm. who was talking about the self-esteem movement particularly. And he said yeah. sort of like... Uh, he said how he thought it, how it had actually been discovered that it was bullshit and he said mm. you know unsurprisingly for example violent psychopaths think pretty highly yeah. of themselves <laughs> yeah well that was it baumeister so baumeister who's the guy the, the, the scientist that exploded all that that, that, dis, that proved that this these weren't good ideas his dad was a literal nazi mm. so he's a second generation immigrant from germany and his dad fought with the nazis in the second world war and then they moved to I can't remember where they moved to, but they moved to America and he was brought up there. And he said, you know, Hitler didn't have a problem with, 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 um, you know, with, with, with low self-esteem. He had pretty high self-esteem. Because mm -hmm. all the ideas, and I grew up with all these ideas, that sure. everything that's wrong with you is because you've got low self-esteem. And actually, it's, uh, it's not true. And, 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 and they did, there was a very interesting study recently, which I talk about in the book, the University of Amsterdam actually took, they, 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 they studied 500 different families over a two-year period. And they rated the family, the parental styles for what they call parental overpraise, so how much overpraise they were giving their children. Mm -hmm. And they found every six months the children's rate of narcissism was rising. Mm -hmm. Every six months, even these children who were subject to this parental overpraise. And, you know, what did we have in the 90s? We had just a whole epidemic of parental overpraise that's that was the parenting style at the time so it's quite extraordinary mm -hmm. the, the thing and, and it was extraordinary to me to find out actually that it was a just a lie like mm -hmm. they knew that the science had not told them that it was true and and yet they deliberately covered it up mm -hmm. and now now we've come up to i guess essentially the present day the i think the last thing i'd like to talk about before opening up to questions from the audience is the idea and of course the word selfie is very much a kind of a a digital yeah. word in a way um this, do you think that the you, know, you talk about this overpraise in the 90s? Mm. 
Do you think the sort of... Do, firstly, are we facing a sort of an epidemic of narcissism and mm. self-obsession at the moment? And if we are, is that something that do you think is a result of the self-esteem movement? Or do you think it's more, or in some way, more inherently connected to the different ways we now communicate? Or is there a link between, so, between the three? So... The, the, the scientists who, who discovered this rise in narcissism, they, they, they got a lot of criticism because, she, because Jean Twenge, she wrote a book called The Narcissism Epidemic, and she got a lot of heat, and, and they were, she got attacked quite, quite a lot. And I think part of the reason for that is that she described it as an epidemic, and I think that's overstating it personally a little bit. I, because as I explore in, later in the book, we all have different personalities, and, if you're, and only if you're a certain personality type are you vulnerable to this parental overpraise. Um, so, so I think epidemic is pushing it a bit. That's my my view um I, but but but, the, but i do i mean i go into it in some probably too much detail but the data i do think it's right that, that we have seen this this thing but i don't think it's an epidemic i do think it's changed us as a people but but i think much more important than the self-esteem movement is actually the change in the economy mm -hmm. because just like in ancient greece when the environment was was influencing who we are today it's the economy mm -hmm. and, and and i think the easiest way to 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 kind of ex to point that out is look at who we were in 1965, mm -hmm. the communalistic com communal hippies, and look at who we were in 1985, the greed is good yuppies. I mean, that is an absolute revolution in self. Like, that is extraordinary, that change. In just 20 years, it's no time at all. And what happened right in the middle of that time is 1980, Thatcher and Reagan, mm -hmm. they changed our economy, they transformed it, and, they, uh, and it became neoliberalism. And of course, neoliberalism is this idea that we want to turn as much of human life into possible as into, as, into a kind of competition. It's mm. like the Hunger Games. It's like self versus self. So get rid of the welfare state as much as we can, get rid of the unions, get rid of all the protections we possibly can, unleash business and banking to do what they want, and everyone has to, mm. you know... And then you see it really quite soon. In 1982, you see one of the, one of the studies shows a change in how we're naming our children, which I thought was really interesting. Um, for generations, people were just naming their kids Jennifer, William... Whatever, you know, and then suddenly in 1982 you start seeing the rise of these individual, strange and unusual names and, the, you know, the idea was because they want their children to stand out and be a star. You start seeing the rise of body dysmorphia, muscle dysmorphia. Before 1980, muscle dysmorphia was this very niche, weird, rare disorder in bodybuilders. Mm -hmm. But now more and more men are starting to suffer from you know body dysmorphia and that's because i mean i there was actually a thing in the papers a few months ago saying there's been a 43 percent increase in male eating disorder in just the last two years so that's still mm. going on so, so so 1980 changes everything and, and and what i argue in the book is that that's neoliberalism it's changed you can't really blame the selfie camera i mean the self-esteem idea i think comes out of neoliberalism i think the big thing mm -hmm. is, is is that we live in this self versus self economy in which you have to be pretty self-obsessed in order to get along and there's that idea isn't there that i mean i think today and and you talk about this partic particularly with young people today it's al almost kind of accepted as kind of mm. oh neoliberalism it's all kind of just coming back to what we naturally are yeah. and yeah. yet at the same time there's that really bone chilling quotation from margaret thatcher yes. um oh, which yeah. I, I maybe noted down somewhere but yeah maybe, yeah e economics is the method but my object is to change the yeah, soul yeah it is bone chilling it's when i found that because i mean she didn't this is before she didn't know about richard this bit he didn't know about richard this bit he hadn't started his work yet but in 1981 the sunday times interviewed margaret thatcher and you know what are you going to do what's your big idea to rescue us from the economic chaos of the 70s and that's what she said she said well, she actually the full quote um, and i'm paraphrasing the beginning bit she said you know that my criticism of the economic policy of the last 30 years has all been very collective and it had it, I, I had no idea how collective like a America had been all through the kind of mid period of the 20th century big the high taxation unionization no wonder we had the hippies it was a communal collective economy and she said I want to bring that to an end and as you say she said the the the, the method is is the is economics but the object is to change the soul and look at who, what we've got today I mean my my wife is the editor of Cosmopolitan so she knows young women <laughs> and and what all the young women want to be these days they want to be entrepreneurs they want to be self-starting business people of course I'm not criticizing that it's good in lots of ways um, uh, but 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 we are living in kind of Thatcher's wet dream in a way we you know everybody wants to be their own business person nobody wants to be an employee anymore we all want to to be these little islands of profit and connected to the the digital world in that case mm. like do you think that is um the way we we exist online the way we uh communicate online do you think that has only consolidated this I, I, well, 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 I, well, yeah i i i think i i think 
the, 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 the kind of digital culture, the social media culture that's emerged mm -hmm. is just a product of, uh, of these much more powerful economic forces. Like we could have used this social media in any, in any which way we, we, we could. So the, but the ways in which we are using it is just a, is a mirror. It's reflecting mm -hmm. who we are. Um, the, the selfie camera was launched in 2010, I think it was. It was called the front-facing camera when they launched it. The idea was it's for FaceTime and Skype. You can talk to your nan. That's what they thought we were going to use it for, but that's not what we used it for. <laughs> we used it for taking pictures of ourselves and, um, and, uh, and getting likes. And this is an interesting thing I've learned since I wrote the book, that they've done a study about Western versus Eastern selfie taking. Yeah. And in the West, it tends to be me. But in Confucian cultures, there's, there's usually a big oh. gang of people. It's interesting. But, but yeah, so I, I, think, I, I think, of course, it's, there's a, you know, there's a, the, 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 there's a kind of self you know it's, it's kind of pushing itself further and further into the extreme i'm sure there's that element to it too but i, I really think that selfie culture social media digital culture it, it, it's just emerging out of these much more powerful forces yeah. which i think is the in the economy mm -hmm. on which note i'm going to open it out to the audience i'm sure there are, oh there's a question right there immediately <laughs> we'll get a microphone to you so everybody can uh, can hear you H hello um I'm American and I was raised with the dogma of if you believe in yourself then you can do anything you yeah. want <laughs> yeah. and I'm wondering how you've been received in the States because this is radical to say this is, is probably even shown to be nonsense mm. and has nothing to do with self-esteem and mm. you can be a bad person and still love yourself and I'm thinking uh, the example of for example uh, somebody who challenges that you know religious belief like um, Tiger Mom the battle hymn of the tiger. Yeah. and she came out and said you know maybe succeeding is not a about loving yourself but maybe su succeed maybe you don't succeed because you love yourself maybe you love yourself because you succeed and she was just trashed in mm. the press and but it's vilified <laughs> so yeah. I'm wondering how the Americans yeah. are taking what you've said well it ha it's not being published in the States until February so I've got all that to, I've got all that to look forward to brace yourself but, but I know but, but but I do I argue very strong in the book that, that, that we live that we are told a lie there's a big lie at the heart of our culture and we're told it every day well, not every day i'm exaggerating but there's a big lie at the heart of our culture and it says that you can do anything you want to do you can be whoever you want to be you can be beyonce you can be michael jordan and it's toxic you know it's a toxic lie because a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the people get to live their dreams like that most of us the story of our lives is failure but and if we're told you can be whoever you want to be and do whatever you want to do the self there's no biological route to it you're just this wonderful godlike thing that can be molded any which way that when you fail which you will it's your fault that's that's the only message you can take from that and that is why i mean i begin the book talking about the awful rises we're seeing in self-harm in body dysmorphia in um eating disorder in suicidal ideation we're seeing in the west in britain in america and my argument is that a lot of that is that, 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 that we are living in an ever more perfection demanding culture and i think it's having a terrible effect on especially young people but all of us just to play devil's advocate there a moment if you stop telling people that do you think there's a chance that, for example, the Beyoncé's and the Michael Jordans mm -hmm. wouldn't therefore pursue their dreams yeah. and therefore wouldn't rise? Yeah, to yeah, the I do. Yes, no, no, it's that, that, that's, that's absolutely right. And I, I think I don't. I, I mean, the book is slightly polemical, but but up, only up to a point because you can't sit there and attack neoliberalism saying this is this monster in a cave because neoliberalism is also amazing i mean neoliberalism has and its project of globalization has lifted millions of people out of poverty in the developing world i mean it's been amazing for lots of people so you it's not as simple as saying we need to get rid of this individualism has been amazing i mean you know you can attack individualism but god what have we achieved in the west for in the last two and a half thousand years yes of course as a I'm sure most of us are left-wing people. We can, we're all well aware of the bad things we've done, but we've done some amazing things too. We've been to the moon, we've made the iPhone and all these other things. You know, so, so you can't get rid of individualism. I mean, it, it, you know, it's a really powerful idea. You alone can change the world. It's a really powerful idea, but it needs to be moderated. And, 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 and I feel, and I think lots of other people are feeling too, that, that neoliberalism has gone too far now. I mean, the global financial crisis was a project of, of neoliberalism. And then Greenspan, who goes... Back to Ayn Rand, you know, he was the one pushing for deregulating banks. And look where, look where it's got us. I mean, when the Grenfell Tower fire happened um, a few months ago in the UK, it was interesting to see the story that immediately came out of that was a story about regulation. It was about the, why are these um, uh, developers not being forced to use this particular cladding, why being the why. So, so we could have 
told a zillion stories about Grenfell, but it was a story about regulation, which is a story about neoliberalism. So I really do feel that change is in the air at the moment, mm -hmm. and it's not obviously going to be pretty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> more questions? Yes. Um, coming more from the angle of uh, individualism in the face of kind of globalization, which is something I'm very interested in, I wanted to know what intention had in the role of the self, in your opinion, because I find that we're constantly bombarded with this idea that if you're a shy person or if you're a non-confrontational person, then you're more likely to behave a certain type of way. Mm or people use that to justify, justify certain behaviors. Mm. Whereas for me, and this is probably as a result of like also um, my parent, like my parents, it's all about what you intend to do and everything is kind of intentional. So if you're a shy person, then you, even if you are less comfortable in a mm. situation, you still intend to behave a certain type of way or um, come forth and like talk to somebody. Mm. And I find, that link to the self seems to be like i haven't really found anything that has talked too much about it yeah i do talk about i, th I think i talk about something that, that speaks to what you're talking and that's the whole back end of the last chapter of the book um uh, and that talks about being shy the kinds of people that we are and this amazing work that's been done on personality psychology mm -hmm. and that is that uh, and what that what what that's found is that who you are at 20 and who you are at 80 is it fairly stable i mean things can change that mostly things can go wrong you can get you can go to war or be assaulted and you can have a breakdown and it can shatter your sense of self but but generally who we are is fairly stable and there's not much we can do about it so um for example your serotonin system which you know is a really important part of our emotional system that's there in place when you're born you can't change it mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, and so, so, so most of who we are, the kind of people that we are, how we react to the world, how we experience the world and think about the world, is a product of our biology, so it's genes, and, it's, and then the rest of, most, of, most of the rest of that is the product of early life experiences over, over which we have no control. So, you know, that's, that's the scientific literature. So that completely goes against this idea, you know, but what we're told in this culture is you can be anyone, you can do anything, but you can't. I mean, I, I mean, Susan Cain's book, Quiet, was very good at talking about just one part of that, which was shyness, introversion, introversion versus extroversion. But there are five parts to that story, and one is neuroticism, one is openness to experience, uh, um, uh, one is conscientiousness, which is kind of how older we are, one is introversion, and... Um, and the other one escapes me at the moment, but 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 but, but I mean I'm amazed that this uh, this stuff isn't more well known, and I think it should be because uh, so part of the part of self is I'm talking about my own journey through this and being brought up to believe because I, I have always been brought up to believe that you've got low self esteem. So I went to therapy and I kind of failed all my exams and I was an alcoholic, um, uh, and you know the, the the story over and over again was you've got low self esteem, and in order to cure yourself, you need high self esteem. And I believed that until I started doing this work, and then what I found out was actually I did a test. You can do it online. Um, it takes ten minutes. It's called the Newcastle Personality Assessor, and gives you a rough kind of idea of what your personality is. I'm very high in trait neuroticism, and that goes hand in hand with having low self esteem. And there's nothing nothing I can do about that. So when I first realised that, I was kind of like in despair, thinking, great, so this is me now. I'm <laughs> fucked. Brilliant. But actually, it was amazing because, because, what you, th because the next place you go is, oh, great, I can stop bothering myself now. And actually, what I found since I did this is I just don't beat myself up anymore. Like, I realise now, okay, you're neurotic, you worry too much about stuff, you can be grumpy, as a you know, the Esalen thing, um, but that's not because you've failed in some way, that's not because you're broken in some way, that's not because you're there's something wrong with you you've got some kind of psychological disease it's just because of how your brain is so stop trying to beat yourself up and just be you and when you get things wrong it's not because you're the devil it's because you're a neurotic mm -hmm. and just say sorry you know so 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 i just think having this intelligence about who i am has been such a liberation even though it was really bad news like because the only one you don't want to be is neurotic all the others are really good for different reasons but neurotic is <laughs> really bad uh, um so but but even then it was so refreshing because i mean i actually interviewed this guy daniel nettle a professor who came up with that test and he, he just said you know life is complicated and difficult enough without us constantly beating ourselves up for not being this extroverted happy friendly person that we're all told that we should be aiming towards so i for me that was really powerful but how they're going to take that in the states who knows <laughs> <laughs> okay i think we've, yeah, we've got time yeah, yeah. for one more question anybody this lady there um i belong to a research group and a couple of years ago uh, they did um 
um, a colloque on animals and um, there were a lot more propositions coming from England and from France. Mm. And so I have a question for you. Have you seen today on the BBC the problem about the who is going to have the rights on the monkey taking a selfie? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the photographer has got his way now, for at, least for the, at least until Peter Petter appeal. But yeah, no, I saw the monkey taking the selfie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not familiar with this story. <laughs> yeah, so a monkey took a selfie, and then the guy, the photographer, whose camera it was, was like, yes, I'm in the money. But then the, <laughs> pit, the, the pit, is it Peter or Petter? Peter. Peter um, sued him on behalf of the monkey and said, that's not your money. And he, he, but he's destroyed him, like he's bankrupt now. <laughs> it's, because it's, a bit of a, it's a thorny one. I don't have an opinion on it, I'm afraid. I just mm. think it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> On which note, um, I think, unfortunately, we have to finish. Although the evening isn't over, as usual, please do stick around, have a glass of wine with us, continue the conversation. I'm sure Will would be happy to sign Absolutely. Uh, books. We have stacks of them at the front, so please do pass via the, the till on your way here. We'll get all of these transported to the front in a moment. Um, we've had a really in-depth conversation, yet I feel we've barely scratched the surface of the book. It's such a, it's such a rich book full of both stories and ideas and, and experiences, and it's quite a ride, I think, both for the, for the reader, and I think it also okay. was for, <laughs> for yeah. Will. Um, yeah. so, um, so do stick around by yourself. For Thanks for coming, book, everybody. And give it up one more time Thank for you. Will Starr.